1944, uh, Rogers and Hammerstein organized a producing firm to put on shows that weren't necessarily of their own writing. Uh, they wanted to advance the work of other artists, and they wanted to kind of get behind other composers. Uh, one of their projects as producers was a musical comedy, which would be based on the fabled exploits of sharpshooter Annie Oakley, a real person um, who was perhaps not quite as bouncy as the fictional character would wind up in the musical, but nonetheless a fascinating per uh, uh, person in her own right. As you know, they got Jerome Kern interested in writing that music, and he passed away um, and was unable to complete that. But the composer that they found uh, to replace him was at the time at the top of his profession, uh, Irving Berlin. Uh, Berlin, by this point, now you can see the story is not quite that this uh, eager young rookie was uh, given this very big job, because by this time, Berlin had a number of hits. He had already had all of the success with Alexander the Ragtime Band. He had already had all of his success with uh, When I Lost You, God Bless America, White Christmas, a number of hit individual songs, and a number of his songs have been placed into reviews and into shows and sort of loose scores. So it, it was not a terribly big leap for him to put his own original stamp on this show. Uh, Andy Get Your Gun is what you would call a real American musical score. And this is probably one of the first scores that starts to look and sound like the musicals that you probably got on board this course thinking that we'd be talking about. It has a lot of stuff in it, not a bad song in it. It features, among other things, Anything You Can Do, which is a piece that I'm going to have linked to our module, um, An Old Fashioned Wedding, the very iconic song, There's No Business Like Show Business, um, a very cute piece I've also linked called Doing What's Comes Naturally. Here you get a real taste of Berlin using his sense of humor because some of the jokes don't just come from the lyrics, but in many cases also come to us uh, from the orchestration. Um, there's a lot of really cute bits of, of how the, the orchestra is, is put together in that song. And there's a nice Berlin ballad called I Got Lost in His Arms. Uh, Annie Get Your Gun uh, featured um, Ethel Merman in the role of Annie Oakley. You will hear about Ethel Merman frequently uh, in coming uh, units. She's sort of one of those people who seems to have been everywhere. Uh, Merman really is kind of at the center of the American musical of the 20th century. Here's a woman who gets her big break playing Annie Oakley for Irving Berlin. She is very good friends with Cole Porter. She is right there when Stephen Sondheim is asked in his very earliest parts of his career to write the lyrics for a show like Gypsy uh, and, and playing the central role there. She winds up uh, appearing in several Gershwin shows. She's sort of connected to almost all of the people that we cover in here and was one of the great American singers. People love her or hate her. And if you look up some of what she sounded like, uh, well, you can make up your own mind. Keep in mind that Ethel Merman was loud, and that was a good thing, because Ethel Merman is a little bit more powerful uh, than, than most PA systems, and uh, didn't need a whole heck of a lot of amplification uh, in her day. Um, the story of Annie Get Your Gun is kind of, well, it's been cleaned up, not cleaned up, but sort of spruced up a little bit to turn it into more of a musical comedy. Uh, but it mostly features the tale of, of a real institution called Buffalo Bill's Traveling Wild West Show. Sad thing. I know there are many sad things about what happened to Native Americans in the history of our country. Um, perhaps one more ignominy, perhaps one more embarrassment, one more horrible thing might just be that not only are many of them um, obviously killed, obviously rounded up and placed in reservations and places like that, uh, to make a living, some of them wind up working uh, deliberately restaging great Western battles as entertainment and, and sort of pretending to die and pretending to go down and defeat again and again as part of the tour. Um, it was sort of a come and see how these great battles were waged. That was part of uh, Buffalo Bill Cody's show. He was a real person as well. Some of it also featured, you know, cattle, uh, you know, rustling, uh, you know, rodeo type stuff. Uh, stunts and that sort of thing, and there was a sharpshooting act, and that usually meant shooting tin cans off of railing, shooting the ace of spades out of a deck of cards that get tossed in the air. Things that um, their original sharpshooter, Frank Butler, in the play, uh, is quite good at. Things that Annie Oakley, uh, a woman that they discover sort of just living uh, sort of out in the wilderness and not particularly sophisticated and, and, and not educated in any way, but she's a real uh, natural, with a gun, um, she's better than Frank Butler. And most of the story is about Frank and Annie's sort of uh, rivalry. Uh, and of course, when stories like this are put together, they're just bound to fall in love eventually and spend a lot of their time bickering with sort of a, of a flirtatious thing underneath that. 
And that's kind of what winds up happening. Parts of Annie Get Your Gun also wind up discussing, at least briefly, how Native Americans are treated, both as performers in a traveling show and just in general. And that story is touched on a little bit in the musical. Um, it's, it's easy to imagine that had Jerome Kern uh, lived and written this piece, it might have been a lot heavier, and it probably would have dealt with this issue a lot more front and center. Uh, the Berlin version is a little bit more comic. It's a little bit lighter. Um, it's a lot of fun. It has that heavy orchestra, almost Disney sound to much of the, uh, much of the music that, that I think most people associate with show tunes in the most uh, stereotypical sense of the word. Um, as a result, I think this is kind of a turning point. If you've been with us through all of this stuff, and we've dealt with a lot of operetta, a lot of grainy, old-fashioned music, the show tunes are coming. The, sun, the stuff that you may just recognize, the stuff that you may have seen or even performed yourself in some community or school group, those shows are, are the things that we come upon. And Annie Get Your Gun is, is one of those early examples um, from 1946. Berlin, as I said, lived uh, past 100. Although he did not, um, perhaps wisely, he didn't really uh, produce music that was out there uh, and released to the public all of that time. Uh, by the 1950s, Berlin sort of quieted down. He kind of focused on writing. Uh, he continued to write songs, but he wrote a lot of them for his own personal entertainment. That stuff sort of got rediscovered after his death, and many people uh, spent a lot of time just going through his papers, just still saying, well, here's another song, and another song, and another song. Um, but Berlin was content to retire, to quietly cash the royalty checks from songs like God Bless America, Like Christmas, and you can bet those are pretty good checks and continued living and answering his mail whenever people did have questions for him, and uh, donating money to uh, a number of charities, and especially to young uh, songwriters, until his death uh, in 1989. Uh, Berlin's really kind of one of the great American stories. He comes in as an immigrant. He immediately uh, uh, sets up business in New York. He is wiped out during the, the stock market crash. He's there as a soldier in the Second World War, and he returns to uh, build up uh, a whole catalog of popular songs that we still know today. Really kind of the iconic story from beginning to end. Um, the, the composer we talk about next, uh, just so that you're ready for this, will be George Gershwin, who has a little bit more of a, a classical and a jazz pedigree than this pop pedigree that, that Mr. Berlin has. Some of Berlin stuff, if you listen closely, starts to sound like swing, and that's not a mistake. A lot of swing music in the 1930s and 40s um, comes out of the marches. It also comes out of the idea of putting the emphasis at the beginning of musical phrases instead of the end, which kind of gives them a, fe a feeling of urgency. I don't want to say that this leads outright to rock, but it certainly leads to pop. It certainly leads to this notion that the beat and the rhythm and the urgency of it is important. And so that even in this time period, um, we have somebody like Berlin writing songs that probably uh, young people uh, probably have to explain to their parents because their parents are used to three-quarter time that sort of meanders more evenly and doesn't do the urgent, crazy things that syncopated uh, uh, ragtime might do. So Gershwin next. Um, like I said, we've got a bunch of, um, of a bunch of selections for you to listen to connected to this module. Also, you'll notice we started. I'm really excited about the uh, the discussion groups. Um, Please be aware, we're going to post another one, and these are a part of the participation grade. A part of that is that uh, we ask that you participate a little bit in those discussions. Uh, in most cases, it's me sending you all out to find another song by this composer. Finding a song by Irving Berlin should be a snap. That one should not be too hard at all. So um, thanks again for sticking with us. Please uh, keep the emails coming and all of the contacts, and please keep participating in the discussions. And uh, next time, we'll, we'll talk about George Gershwin.